talk about what's happening in, uh, well, some 600,000 plus households this morning. And that's the households where youngsters are waking up to get their GCSE results. Some getting them uh, online, some going into school to get them. I've got to wait until after nine o'clock to hear what my daughters are. A lot of parents have gone through it. A lot of parents will go through it. Uh, and indeed, uh, we've all probably all gone through it ourselves, have we not? Whether it's uh, GCSEs or what I explained to the youngsters in my office are used to be called O levels, but uh, this is the um, the the, uh, the second year after lockdown years when we did not have any exams for GCSEs in 2020 or 2021 or indeed A levels as we had the results last uh, last week. Uh, but we did see massive grade inflation uh, last year. Of course, we did. Those uh, those grades are not going to be as inflated this year. We're told 300,000 fewer top grades. So that's the sort of A grade and above. Those now in numerically seven, eight, nine grades. But what does that mean for pupils getting their results this morning? Let's talk to Baz Ramaya. He's a former GCSE teacher. Good morning to you, Baz. Morning, Julia. Thank Thanks you. for having me on. Oh, thank you so much for joining us. Look, I think we can all remember getting our results when we were uh, this age and, and A-levels and people wait and the whole family gets involved. And we've had all these messages. Good luck. I hope it all goes well today. Um, these, these exam results aren't quite as um, sort of life-changing as A-level results. They'll be tech results. The results will make a decision about what you, you know, do in your future, your job, uh, you, whether you get to university or not. But they do matter, don't they? Yeah, absolutely, Julian. I just want to open by saying that uh, best of luck to your daughter and best of luck for you on their results day today. <laughs> mainly me, mainly me. Uh, She's really cool about it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we don't have all the, the data just yet, but what we can see and what we are expecting to see today is two things. One is that we're very likely going to see a widening of the gap between rich and poor. We saw this widen a lot last year to the widest that it's been since 2012. So we're seeing poorer pupils trailing further behind wealthier pupils in terms of their GCSE results and we're also going to see a widening in the regional gap I think that's what the data is suggesting yeah. so between north and south if we look at GCSE results last year and also a level results last week as well I think we're going to see pupils in the north getting a lot of those lower grades and that's, and, that, and that's largely a rich and poor issue isn't it so many of the richer people Absolutely in this country well. living in the south and, and this is something that we look we have banged on about this or since 2020 um, is that you know so many schools like my daughter's school six hours of online lessons every single day um, and so many schools, so many youngsters, even those actually at some leafy middle class schools, didn't get any lessons for the first few months of the 2020 lockdown. Um, they just lost that time. A lot of pupils didn't go back. We know that year 11, that's fifth form for those of us in old money, the year taking these exams, um, that has seen the highest rate of pupil absence. So even when schools did reopen to all pupils, so many pupils didn't come back. It was particularly that sort of these disaffected 15 and 16 year olds who, who didn't come back to school. We know, you know, every day, every Every week you're out of school that that's just that's just you know another grade fall so we, we are going to see the impact of that Absolutely, Julian. I think you're right to talk about the, the the major impact that the pandemic had on disrupting young people's education. But I think we should also remember that young people who are getting their results today have been in education for about 10 years or so. Yeah. And over the course of that 10 years, they've seen school funding fall by 9%. They've seen teacher recruitment... Well, school funding, you know, school funding can I clarify, school funding per pupil. School funding has gone up in real terms, but per pupil it has gone down. Uh, people by 9% over the course mm. of that period. You're right, Julia. Uh, we've seen teacher recruitment and retention get to the point where teachers are now leaving the profession at record numbers. And we've also witnessed the uh, growth of a mental health crisis among young people. Yeah. Uh, it was just revealed yesterday by the Institute for Fiscal Studies that one in five 16-year-old girls yeah. has had contact with NHS mental health services. Yeah. So these young people have been through a lot. And then on top of that, they've also experienced the pandemic. We need to keep that in mind when we look at results today. And the government needs to keep that in mind when it thinks about what it's going to do for this generation to make sure they can have a fairer start in yeah. life. And what's particularly frustrating, I was a very big fan of Michael Gove when he was Education Secretary, not a big fan of much he's done since then. Uh, but as Education Secretary, that effort to to close that gap, I mean, he himself went to a, you know, on a scholarship to a top uh, school, but you know, he's adopted himself. He's really aware that you know these, these, small these moments in life, these sort of sliding doors moments make the difference. And he wanted that that not to be the case for poorer kids to make sure you brought standards up in 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 the bog standard comprehensives you know just insisting on high standards and high aspiration and and and, and it really did it really did make a difference. There's no doubt at all school standards went back up. On international comparisons, our schools were doing so much better. Um, and and yet so much of that has been thrown away because well-off pupils, you know, even if they didn't get lessons from their school, they were still OK because mum and dad were at home and there were books at home and other kids just simply didn't have that. How do we deal with this? We've still got, isn't it, 
Over 100,000 kids who aren't back in school, who should be in school uh, routinely. Uh, we, we, we've now got you know a bunch of kids, whether they are in reception class or they've just done their GCSEs or A levels, who who you know had the privilege privilege you know the luck of being at a school where they got lessons and had homework marked and teachers who gave a damn in the last couple of years and other kids who haven't. How do we overcome that? I think you're right, Julie. I think a lot of the issue here has been how the government has responded to the learning loss that occurred over the pandemic. So let's take, for example, uh, the government's flagship educational recovery program, the National Tutoring Program. A brilliant idea. Uh, the idea was to give disadvantaged young people access to one to one and small group tutoring. Um, tutoring is known to be very effective for improving young people's academic achievement. And then when we look at the actual data, what turned out to be the case is that the majority of people who are accessing the national tutoring program weren't from the poorest families. They were from families who, yeah. were, who weren't on free school meals. So I actually had to have a lot of that, that program has achieved some good nonetheless. And what I want to see the government doing is looking at that program, learning those lessons and thinking about how it can go forward, improving young people's access to one to one tutoring mm -hmm. so we can make sure those young people who are from disadvantaged backgrounds are getting the same privileges that those from wealthier backgrounds are able yeah. to get and are getting a fairer start yeah. in life and, and are able to get the grades that they're capable of. And bearing in mind, there are other countries where, you know, they, I mean, you know, in China, I know there's lots of differences in the Chinese system, Singapore system, other countries that do very well educationally. It's a very different sort of focus on in, in, in how children learn. It's not necessarily that healthy. But you know, the poorest pupils in uh, you know in Shanghai, from the you know the the bottom you know Dessa, they do better than our brightest pupils here. There, you know, we money is not the excuse. I, th I think there's a lot of truth to that. But what we also do see in the data is that countries that have a lower degree of economic inequality also have like more more parity in terms of like pupil outcomes academically. Mm -hmm. And given that we do have quite rampant economic inequality in this country, that goes in some way to explain these differences that we see. And we can see how that manifests, Julie. If you are a young person who grows up in Tower Hamlets, just down the road from where I am, where I used to teach, then you very likely live in a, a house with 13 other people. You don't have a quiet place to study. Yep. As exactly as you were saying, Julie, your parents aren't able to help you with homework or supervise you working. You probably go to a school that struggles with teacher recruitment and retention. Compare that to a child who's growing up in a leafy suburb yep. where they do have a quiet place to study they are privately tutored they do go to a school in an affluent area that has great teachers yeah. we can see how that economic inequality it's, also it's not, affects our education it's not a mystery is it none of it's a mystery basra thank you for joining us appreciate that um let me bring in uh,